Welcome back. This is Franz Cantor, cartoonist, illustrator. I do caricatures. I, I feel pretty. Um, <laughs> this is, this is and witty and and whatever and wise. Yeah. So I'm here at the Australian Cartoon Museum. I'm joined here by my co-host, uh, the the founder of the Australian Cartoon Museum, Jim Bridges. Huzzah! There we go. So today we've got something really important. Um, it's uh, we're going to be doing a caricature of "If You Dream Upon a Star," Walt Disney, not Mickey Mouse or Goofy. I love Goofy. Oh, um, you're Norse. Oh, the world owes me a living. <laughs> um, we're going to be doing um, Walt Disney. And this is towards the end. I think this is like in the late '60s. So this is when. He, he appeared on a stamp, I think, you know, in 1968. I think he died in 68, didn't he? I don't know. So this is the, the Walt Disney who I remember growing Uncle up. Uncle Walt. Very um, much, yes. Uncle Walt. Well, sitting at his desk, um, like um, Walter Lanx, Lance, Walter Lance from um, Woody Woodpecker fra uh, fame, you know, he would be sitting at his desk and introducing the character of Woody Woodpecker, mm. who would jump around on his desk. Yeah. Well, n nobody really jumped around except, I think, once Donald came into his office. Um, but uh, mainly, um, Walt Disney used to present the wonderful world of Disney. So growing up a Sunday night, 6 p.m. or 6.30, whatever it was, they'd be presenting... Um, cartoon documentaries or films um, from the Disney archive. Frontierland. Yeah, all of that stuff. So it's the full-on Disneyland's, you know, tales from Frontierland or... Tomorrowland, you know, a wonderful Davy world Crockett. to come. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that. It's like, um, you know, there's a very big um, influence on me with uh, space, obviously. Um, so let's try, let's try to analyse what we're doing here. Um... Again, I've got something like a like a chop to look for. So w why why am I so fascinated by these these strange shapes because you know, rather than ovals or circles? Because they're shapes, and shapes are basic. And then what you do you with do that, what you do with that shape, yeah. the variation of that shape is what excites you. Hmm. So. Um, Finding the um, this is an impression that you get from you know the angles of the head. So let's look at this. So I looked at this and I thought, well, there's like a, a chip. There's a like a Dorito. Okay, what more can I get? What other shapes can I get? Well, there's a little bit of a twisting as well as a tilting of the head. So um, that actually presents another sort of uh, a another um, element to, to tinker with. And that is the element of surprise. No, it's the element of um, perspective. Because um, the, the head is turning to th away from us, to, the, to our left, and it's also tilting down. So you're looking down on the skull uh, a little bit more. So it's kind of like this. So let's, yeah, sort of like, let's try to match it down there. Like this. So you've got a lot of space up here, okay? And you've got less space under here where the jaw would be. I've actually removed the jaw for uh, purpose because it keeps just keeps, keeps fall, dislocating. Keeps falling off. Where it's got a glass jaw. And uh, that's what we're looking for. So that's very interesting because it gives, gives the shape variety. Okay, so that's that's very interesting from a point of view of drawing. It presents us with a challenge that we can look forward to. So, what else can we say about this face? Well, the the shadows. It's kind of um, generally over over. Uh, what do you call it? A um, diffused uh, lighting. So it's kind of an overhead. Um, lighting situation i'd say it's outdoor lighting yeah no i don't know i don't think it's an outdoor lighting it outdoor would be very very extreme shadows well even on a on a 
overcast day. Mm, okay. So it's a very soft lighting, which is very that flattering is very soft, yeah. for features. Okay, so he's got very, um, very gentle features. He's got like a, a, a lot of, he's, there are a lot of lines and furrows and shapes and in his face that we're going to talk about. But they're very evenly distributed. So there's nothing really to say that, you know, he's an inveterate liar or he's this or he's that or, or he's a predominantly happy person or he's predominantly a sad person. Um, all of the lines are, are particularly... Um, there aren't, there aren't sort of a predominance of one over the other. So, for example, um, usually there are lines that indicate the mouth is closed a lot on a lot of people. Um, these are lines like this. So these lines are dead giveaway. So it's almost what I call the ventriloquist trap, the, the ventriloquist dummy jaw. Um, there's a picture of somebody... A no, it? there's a picture. It's the opposite. Somebody who doesn't talk a lot. Because if they were talking a lot, then these lines, these muscles, would be formed in a different direction. Well, you don't have to talk a lot. You, you, you talk with your pencil. Mm. Well, as I should. But um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, with caricature, you're looking at... Um, there's different possibilities with caricature. You're looking at exaggeration and... Uh, um, um, simplification. So the simplification, like converting the head of Walt Disney into a chop, right, uh, is a simplified shape that we're approaching the head. Then we're going into exaggeration, which is changing the proportions of things. So within the new confines of the shape that we're, we're um, working with, we're going to create a dialogue between the elements of the face, which I like to gather together in a sort of a mask zone. If you could try to imagine a Mexican-style wrestling mask or uh, a T-zone, which is probably more uh, uh, accurate for, like, oils and things in a makeup. Um, this is where the oils are concentrated in the face. So what, what does it mean is, what it means is that all of these elements, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, they create a, a sort of a relationship with one another. And that's what we're going to be looking at and focusing on. Because that's where our, ultimately, the recognition factor of who it is we're drawing is going to come from. All right, so I've taken the opportunity to create a, uh, a rough thumbnail. And from that, I kind of like those shapes. I've sort of extrapolated that into a very rough start on the toned paper. So this is Strathmore Grey. So this is quite a, a you know, neutral colour. Well, not neutral. It's actually a little bit warm. Um, and we're going to be using a brown pencil. In this case, it's, uh, there's one that's terracotta. Uh, what else have we got? We've got a red one. This is uh, Sienna. Sienna. We've also got another red one, which is um, a Tuscan red. So these are like earthy colors, yes? And we'll be using white pencils, Albrecht Durer's and Polychromos and very, very soft that may break. Um, Prisma and, colors. And usually do. So these are Prisma colors. They're very soft. Um, Albrecht Durer is a Faber-Castell. That's quite soft as well, but it's also like a watercolor. And the hardest pencils are these polychromos. So these tend to not break. These will tend to break. So the softer the pencil, the more propensity it has of breaking. So you've got to be very aware of that and, and always put, handle with care the softer pencils, okay? Everything you buy is expensive, obviously. Pencils have been around a long time, haven't they? Yeah. Do you think they'll invent a pencil that doesn't break? No. It's... It, the whole um, reason for uh, pencils is a really good quality. You're paying for quality um, product, so it's pigment, which is really, really good quality pigment. Well, that's true, but if a lot you, of pigment. But if you yeah, drop the pencil, you good probably, you're probably going to break it anyway inside. Yeah. Yeah. So don't break it. Don't drop it. No. Always buy a spare pencil or a couple. So. Um, yeah, I'm just. Uh, I've taken the opportunity to put a few of these lines, throw a few of these shapes in very lightly. So I'm going to go and start to build up a bit of form. Um, just
this very slowly and with great care uh, and using the brown pencil first. The black pencil and the white pencil I'm going to be using to create a sense of contrast and building up the, the darkest areas and then the lightest areas to sort of create a sculptural effect. In, so, our, um, in our short but vivid um, uh, relationship, um, <clears throat> we've often talked about Walt Disney, mm. but you're, um, you've been quite critical of him. I'm not critical of him at all. I don't oh, see. Okay. It, it's, uh, there's it's a lot of scuttlebutt represents. around, you know, it's Walt what, Disney. Yeah. There's a lot of scuttlebutt. There's like, you know, well, when he died, he put his head in a, in a, he froze himself, or he put his head in a. That's not true. <laughs> you know, it's not true. A jar like you know, Futurama style. That's not true. Um, and uh, he, he, you know, there was a lot of like really bad things said about him. I don't know anything about that. Um, I'm not. I don't want to discuss anything about, you know, he's he was this or he was that or whatever. This is just conjecture oh, so, and rumor at the well, moment. We, yeah, but um, so basically, um, it's it's his organisation and what it is today. Well, the organisation that he started um, yeah. grew, and it and grew, grew to an extent that it started to swallow up when he it's a when he died. It's a juggernaut. Years after he died, it yeah. started to swallow up other companies, oh. other creative companies. Now, obviously, you know, um, people build companies for a profit. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying they shouldn't do that, you know, I'm all for it. But the fact is that you've got one player buying up all of these, all of these um, intellectual properties. So today, the Disney Corp, the Mouse Factory... And we'll talk more about the Mouse Factory. Um, has monopolies. They monopolise. They've actually, you know, um, taken over all of the good stuff from TV and film um, to the extent that, like, they own Marvel, they own Star Wars, they own the Muppets, the Muppets, they own um, Family Guy, Simpsons, and that's what a lot of people are a little bit peeved about. They, they own Rupert Murdoch too, don't they? Uh, yeah, they bought Fox. Well, yeah, Fox. They don't own Rupert. Rupert sold it. Oh. He doesn't, you know... He's, he's hemorrhaging money with the newspapers. Um, they did, obviously didn't want to buy the newspapers. OK, so let's get back to the, um, to the man. So growing up... Um, you know, watching the wonderful world of Disney, you get a really, uh, you appreciate the quality, the the world, the home, the family, the Disney family, um, on you know, in their in their in their message in their products. So everything they did was quality. You know, um, my kids growing up, my eldest daughter used to collect um, Disney. There were Disney shops then. Um, she used to collect Disney. Music boxes and things, you oh, know. Okay. So, um, and they were beautifully done. They're beautifully made. Expensive. Yeah, very expensive. I could never afford them. Mm. And, um, and and they never end up in op shops. No, people. No, people tend to um, swing hang on, on to them, yeah. um, like Royal Daltons or something. They're, they're actually. Um, anyway, I, 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 that's beside the point. But the, the, the main thing I wanted to say was um, he created this world, this, this family, the Disney family. And he did that really well. He did, you know, obviously with the Mickey Mouse Club and, and a succession of... of well, Disneyland. Vet, well, know. Disneyland, yeah. The yeah. park, the theme park. And Actually, Disney meant... Major... Disney meant family entertainment. Yes. That's it what it synonymous meant. Synonymous with family entertainment. Yeah. It wasn't a big mega structure, like parents that took over the world who would take their their kids to the pictures who don't really care what the film was. They just mm. taking their kids to the pictures. It's a Disney film, they just, okay, okay, they, they and wouldn't. the kids would enjoy it because yeah. it's a quality entertainment, you yeah. know. Um, and it, it 
irrespective of what the film was, actually, you know, you get excited about it. I, I remember getting excited about Boatniks. <laughs> I was pretty... I said, um, Girl from Uncle? Oh, yes, please. I'll watch that. Thank you. Uh, Boatniks, I had a sinking feeling about that. <laughs> hmm. Um, but all of the Ken, the um, I never said Ken Russell, but the um, uh, oh, what's his name? Kurt Russell. Kurt films. Russell's. Oh yeah, the c computer war tennis shoes, sneakers or something, wasn't it? Tennis shoes. Okay, I thought it was sneakers. Okay. Yeah, and and you know that's the, his first film, isn't it? I, I, don't I think know. it is. I think it's Kurt Russell's first film. So anyway, um, you know, it was it was uh, family entertainment, and you know, people would uh, watch it, um, and they kind of they owned, or, or it seemed like they owned little golden books, which was an Australian staple diet for children. Yes, yes. You know, they would um, a lot of Disney stuff in it. Yeah, lots. like I remember, I had Old Yeller, and I'd never seen Old Yeller till yeah. I was an adult on v VHS. Yeah. Um, see, we don't get all of the Disney stuff here. We no. only get some of the Disney stuff. Yeah. And you have to be sort of... Um, well, I, I think that you'd, you'd fill up uh, a couple of houses if you got all the Disney stuff, mm. the simple as that. Is. So yeah, they were really early into merchandising Yeah. And on all levels. And, um, yeah, um, and actually they I, got to this... I mean, a, a, an animated film would take sometimes five, up to five years to finish or mm. like say let's say two and a half years to say three and a half years that's mm. the average i think mm. and of course um they they would sell um so much merchandising that after a while um the 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 film that might cost 20 million dollars to make was just the the kickstarter to the merchandising you know mm. made more money on the merchandising than the actual film it's based on yeah and then he he uh, that, well, that, that was in the you know in the sixties yeah and and, and that merchandising is what set up the huge um, theme parks and yeah and the huge profits uh, and the huge uh, I mean um, without all that uh, they couldn't have taken over as mm. we were just talking about they couldn't have done all that because no. he built it up with such a huge you know yeah records comics uh, books television I mean you know he. Um, when television first started, he actually, they wanted him to run his stuff, his films on TV. He said, no, I want to do my own thing on TV. I want to have... So he, he actually... Yeah, he was a presenter. Yeah, he utilised TV for his purposes. Yeah, not to the sell the, the, the whole Disney yeah. marketing machine, the um, the park and yeah, the brand right. name that's and right. the cartoons yeah. and the shorts and... Yeah. Yeah. You know, TV was a perfect... Um, they could string together a whole show yeah. made up of five or six shorts. And, I, I mean, I don't know, but the, the most popular show when I was a kid, didn't matter what you were, in the westerns or whatever... Yeah. Moscow Circus? And, and it didn't matter what it was on television. Don Amici. It didn't matter what it was on television. Um, all the kids thought that the, the, the Disneyland on television was mm. the most popular show. It was it meant for them. Yeah. It was, you, you, you know, Sunday night before you had to go to school. Well, you went to school. Well, I, I stayed home. Um, on Monday, on Monday morning, all you'd do was Monday, talk about... monday I just all on, week. On Monday, all you'd talk about was what you saw on Disneyland uh, on the night before. That's mm. what everybody talked about. That's what everybody talked about. Yeah. Well, I didn't because I didn't go to school. But the... Um, yeah, I would imagine most people would have, uh, you know, been discussing that. So... Um, there have been some great uh, things. I remember the um, Conquest of Space, I think, was a documentary. It was presented with uh, cartoons. And, mm. um, you know, that was, that's, that's like, if, if you ever want to, why NASA? Watch that film, because it, it really presents... Uh, why like, NASA? Yeah, if you want to know why NASA. Oh, why NASA? Um, you know, watch that film. It kind of presents NASA's... Um, reason for space uh, exploration, man's exploration in a, in a very um, persuasive manner. So, um, 
I, you know, I've got two. Uh, I mean, obviously, if, if Disney came back <laughs> from um, <laughs> from the bottle, from the the freezer. No, if he came back and saw what was going on with his company, mm. I I've got two minds about that. I think he might be a bit disappointed because uh, he was, uh, you know, he he utilised imagination. He actually turned it into a factory, didn't he? Mm. He used to call his. Um, Imagineers, like engineers, Imagineers, um, the people who were building his concepts, like uh, the concepts of uh, Disneyland. He wanted a mm. he wanted a, a a theme park that was totally different, that everybody could go to. They weren't cheap well, and we nasty, could... and you know. Yeah. And they reckon that the cleanest pl- place in the universe is Disneyland because as soon as a they've got some figure that as soon as a paper drops on the floor, mm. it's picked up by somebody within seconds. You know. Right. Anyway, and they've got really strict protocols about people who work there. You know, they have to mm. be. You know. Any, anyway, um, well, they're they're more corporate protocols now. Yeah. They're not they're not really you know but, Disney. But I have a feeling that you see the thing is Disney was always going broke, mm. and the reason he was going broke because he was never satisfied. He was always pushing the envelope. Yeah. And his brother was having hernias all the time because how the hell are we going to finance this next idea? And I mean. He, he he really went against the grain. Everybody thought he was uh, going to go broke w- when he was working on um, um, his first know. feature, which was oh. uh, Snow White, you know? Yeah. And um, e- everybody thought, you know, you can't make a... F- you just can't do this. You just, no one's going to sit down and watch that's a cartoon for 90 me. minutes that's of, right. of animation. And, of course... Of drawings. They just, got, you know, they were really against the wall, big time. Mm. Um, anyway, so and then you know, within a couple of years, he's got two, three films on at once. Yeah. In you know, not just one, but Pinocchio and Fantasia, and you know, he mm. was working on all these other things. So um, I've never a, seen these films. You know, no, so I've I had the impression recently. that if he was, if he lived to be a hundred, so mm. I don't know when he was born anymore. I've forgotten, but he would have been pushing the envelope all the time. I mean, he started Disney World and. But kept mm. on getting bigger and bigger. But um, I always felt it was tragic too because yeah, um, he um, he started the business really. Of, I mean, he really kick-started. I mean, animation had been around, but he really re- grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and kicked it, you know, a mile in front of all the other people who were just they were just working. Uh, he he actually trained people. To draw, he, he, he you know, um, mm. he, he went into all his made feature films and, um, you know, documentaries, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, and, he, and he got the best people and all that sort of stuff, like Pixar are today. Mm. But he set up schools to draw and, you know, he'd have, um, um, you know, um, uh, you know he, all the things that he, that are, are, are now part of animation, um, normal, normalcy, he sort of kick-started to a certain extent. Yeah, but um, he was always pushing the envelope, and he was always broke. Even you know, like everything was the idea. He, you know, uh, the idea is well, it's going to cost this. I don't care. We'll just have a go. You know, and he kept doing it. So I just whereas today Disney is is just a huge money making machine, basically, isn't it? Yeah, just a money making machine um, that's got guarantees left, right, and centre. Because if you own the Muppets and Star Wars and Marvel and and uh, every, I mean, have they bought the Warner Brothers characters yet? <laughs> no. You know, I, I I can see the headlines. Disney buys bugs, but it's know? not like they it's not that like they need them. They don't need them. No. Um, it'd be good if if you know, Warner Brothers. Have they bought Apple yet? Did they bought Apple yet? Are they uh, <laughs> no. They bought Amazon yet? You know. Mm. Um. So I think that Disney's, um, but the tragic part of him is when he died. They, he, mm. When he was dying, someone asked one interview asked him what, what was his um, uh, greatest achievement, mm. and I think he said three things. I think he said Jungle Book, or it, it was either that or um, 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 uh, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, or and and or um, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln yeah, who stood up and animatronic. And, yeah, the animatronic, mm. and he had this thing about. Well, like, he was the first one that did animatronics. Yeah, but he was also had this thing about making things as real as possible, mm. and that's what that's part of his um, that's part of his uh, 
tragedy because all the people who he, he all these young people who he started off, mm. who started off with him, all um, rejected him because he kept on trying to do, he, he kept on wanting them to follow to get the animation to look more and more and more real. And of course, um, that whole, we've talked about the 50s. Yeah. And well, U, they're doing it U, again, aren't they? Yeah, UPA and, and the simplifications. Mm. Um, of, well, of, in, in of images and, yeah. and, and also he wasn't reflecting what's going down in the art world. No. no you know? there was, and yeah. so all the artists want to reflect what's going down in the art world. Well, know? okay, so some of the things that I like were, you know, where in, in the 50s and 60s he started to create a... Um, um, using um, UPA as a, as a model, so a lot of the yeah, designs. But, yeah, but you got cartoons. the impression that actual Disney was sort of forced into that. That's no, I no, he he was he championed it in the end. Like, in the end, but he had he was kick, he was dragged kicking and screaming into it. Mm. I mean, when, when when he went over to Europe uh, on his um, holiday, he um, yeah he ransacked all the 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 art. Basically, not not the yeah, but modern art. Too. Not the mod, yeah, some of the modern art. But he he, he got all the sort of stories, um, yeah, Pinocchio, yeah. all these sort of stories, and he got the best books that are illustrated the subject, and mm. then he would track down these if they were still alive, the artists, and get them to do mm. sketches for him and work with him. You know. Yeah. Well, Salvador Dali. On, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, uh, um, um, I mean, Fantasia. only only Hitchcock and um, and Disney um, mm. went after Dali, but I mean, I mean, my childhood was. To, in... to be fair, though, I think Dali courted Hollywood. I don't think he went after Dali. I think Dali just came to him. Well, that's probably true, but I mean, who else took him up? Mm. Only only Hitchcock and and Disney. Yeah, but you see, my, my I don't know about you, but my childhood. The two biggest influences in my childhood was the Catholic Church and Walt Disney. And, of course, <laughs> right. um, a house divided, you know, two gods. Um, and, of course, uh, when I was a morning paper boy, um, all my wages um, went into little golden books. Right. At just the Disney ones. But a lot of those... Yeah. People who did little golden books also worked for Disney if yep. they weren't doing Disney characters. Yeah. You know? Um, I think Mary Blair worked, didn't mm. she? Yeah, she did. She did a lot of um, little golden books. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I don't, know the, I, don't know, I don't know the history of little golden books. We'll have to do that one day mm. because they're part of people's primal experience, aren't they? Especially in this country. Anyway, mm. I'm just saying, so... Um, Disney could do no, could do no wrong, mm. but as I grew older and television, mm. I saw a lot more um, um, different types of animation, yeah. especially Warner Brothers. And you know, I felt the Disney's were a bit too coy and a bit too sweet. Sweet, mm. yeah. And um, and yeah. you know, but he didn't care because he was not just. You know, he, he as, as I said before, Disney equaled family entertainment. Hmm. Um, but you see, all those people who who um, who uh, were educated by him, mm. who started with him in the beginning, they all wanted to move on, but he didn't. And of course, they they had the strike. Yeah. And that really changed him forever because he saw himself as the father of animation. Mm. Everybody called him the father of animation. Mm. I mean, if you were a famous person. Um, the three things you wanted to do when you went to America, say you're from Europe or something, was to check out the Grand Canyon, New York, and visit Walt Disney. Yeah. Th they're the three things you had to do, you know? Yeah. Because there was nothing like Walt Disney. He was just this incredible god, you mm. know? But those people who actually did the work for Walt, they, they, they felt that, um, like, they grew up. Mm. They, they weren't just going to work for... Uh, wages, uh, you know, what, what Walt was paying because it was basically factory work. A lot of the animation was factory work, wasn't mm. it? And he wasn't paying that, like, n none of the animators were paying. It's not good money in animation. It's a lot of well, hard the Yeah, well, the you know, it actually, they may have started the industry, but the industry went on um, outside of Disney. That's Fletcher right. Studios are paying 
award rates. That's and, right. And Disney and weren't. That's that's exactly right. And so then um, Disney felt that all those people that he'd given them jobs and sort of, it's like he, he saw himself as the father figure yeah. of all those animators. And, of course, after a while, um, you know, people grow up themselves and, and they've got their own families and stuff and they need higher wages and all that. And he just mm. wouldn't do it. Mm. He just he called them commies and all that sort of stuff. So um, from that point on, it changed it changed him, basically. And then he became this grouchy old boss. <laughs> He, I mean, when he, when he'd come up and he'd do the storyboards, he'd do the whole storyboards, he'd act it all out and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But after that, after that experience of the, he just he stepped back. He the stepped office. back, and they were all scared of him because they'd hear him cough because he he was a great smoker. Yeah, and they'd hear him coughing and see that oh god, Walt's coming, you know. And uh, he he could he was really tough on them from mm. that point on mm. um, because he felt that. His children had neglected him; they'd gone against him. Mm. So that—that's the tragedy of him. But also, he—I think he had a, a limited imagination because he really was involved. He really loved the, the fact that. I mean, I don't know about you, but Mary Poppins—you you can cut up an hour out of it, mm. and it's not one of his greatest achievements, I don't think. Mm. But he was wrapped in it, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and, and, and the animatronics, well, I mean, he's breaking new ground with animatronics, mm. and that's what he was interested in, breaking new ground. And that's why I was thinking if he, was, if he lived to be 100, uh, he was interested in making money, but it's only what money could do. Mm. He was, you know, he, he was always... The, they were always uh, had their back to the wall economically. Like, if, if things didn't work out, they were going to mm. come crashing down. Mm. And there's so much during his, um, you know, term... Uh, being the boss, that they, they were they were in deep poo poo. Like mm. the, possi- the the possibility of coming crashing down was was a, a, a an existing thing all the time. Mm. And the people who worried about the money, like his brother, they they're the ones who had all the the heart attacks and they had to carry all that responsibility. But he wasn't that interested. He just wanted the idea, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean. That's part of the American dream, really. It's, it's taking yeah. your idea and making it a reality. That's right. And so that's somebody will. There's, you know, there's a sucker born every minute, I guess. But um, as the saying goes, but there's also the fact that someone, someone will back you. Someone in America will back you. Well, that's the so, other great thing because Disney couldn't have done what Disney did if he was in England. Mm, no. Or no, if he was in not. even Australia or, mm, or Canada no. or no. Europe. No. South America, I mean, only in America where they have that sort of entrepreneurship, you know, that sort of, they believe they can do it, you know, you can, you know, build the, build the, um... Well, it's following a dream, it's building yeah. a dream. The American dream. Yeah. That's right. Well, American dream means many different things, but... Well, it's you know, now it's, the American nightmare. Mm. That's what it's become. Well, yeah, but it's, it's more than just you know consumerism or getting rich or anything like that. It's just yeah. taking your imagination and um, um, making making it into something that lasts. You know, and he did that. It, it was either his imagination or people that that he hired. Either way, it's yeah. um, you know, it was a, a remarkable achievement because he, he just sort of had the ability to um, realise it, to have it happen. Yeah, um, so every every uh, Sunday night he'd be sitting behind his desk and yeah. he may stand up and open up a book or something and show you something. Mm. But basically he'd, he'd introduce you to it. You know, it could be a, yeah, a, adventure a film. Or yeah, adventure or the future. It could, could be or... a western or it could be a kid's kids movie about a dog or something mm. um, or it could be Tomorrowland and talking about this and that yeah or it could that, be God forbid Heidi or Pollyanna or some he didn't do thing. Heidi didn't he okay, no. well. he did Pollyanna but god mm. that's a boring film <laughs> oh. yeah yeah there's um, there's a lot about Disney you can you read you know things at your heart's content well I mean he, he like had such a the... huge effect on society of course they can. I mean, you know, one of the things that um, someone, some, some uh, wag wrote that he kept psychiatrists in business for years because of mm. Bambi's mother gets killed off off screen, and 
Um, Bambi is a film, I don't know if, you, well, most people would have seen it by now, but it's about a deer. Mm, I haven't seen it. And um, his mother gets killed off screen by mm. a hunter. Mm. And of course, <laughs> it traumatised a that. whole generation of people who saw that, that and they, you know, that's what this bloke was saying. You know, they'd go mm. to psychiatrists, go, oh, Bambi's mum got killed, you know, it really upset me, you know. Mm. It, and I'm an adult now, but it still worries me, you know. Mm. And it affected me personally because when I saw Darby O'Gill and Little, little People... Yeah, it was creepy. Yeah, and it had the death uh, coach in it. rotten little leprechaun creatures? <laughs> well, they, they weren't the scary bit. It was the, the Banshee that was in the death coach. Was that the Banshee? Yeah, the Banshee is Wasn't a, the Banshee something else on no, the hill? No, the Banshee is in the death coach. Right. And the Banshee... When someone dies, the Banshee screeches. And right. you hear a screech. You hear this... You know, I understand that, cry. but I thought the banshee was just a ghost, just a woman, and then well, the death coaches. When you're dying, they'll they'll send a coach for you. Yeah, but it's not it's an ordinary like, coach. It's no. a ghost ghost coach. Yeah, skeleton horses and yeah, yeah, death. And the effects of that in that the, the, that they did it was sort of semi animated. Mm. It was really 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 scary. It was scary. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I didn't go to a psychiatrist. Obviously, tough. They dealt with tough death a lot in, you know, things like that. Where's his moustache? Oh, it's coming. Don't worry. Oh God. So, um, you know, they dealt with death a lot. A lot of animals died. <laughs> Disney films. They invented this trope of the lemmings. Did um, they invent yeah, the they lemmings? Made it up. You're kidding. Mm. Okay. And, um, is that in? Is that is that on Wikipedia? Lemmings yeah, lemmings don't jump. Uh, well, it doesn't make cliffs. any sense, does it? It's never made any sense to me. Well, they they, they kind of monopolise the documentary. Um, well, they business. they like in, instead of um, they, they uh, humanised animals. Yeah. Instead of turning Harry, one in, of the first little golden books I had was about a stupid squirrel. Yeah. Called Perry. Yeah. Well, well, that film was huge. Uh, that well, I, I think, didn't know. I think that was the first feature film documentary mm. that was well it's not a not a documentary as such as we know it because it, it was turned into a story you know yeah a dramatic uh, docudrama yeah. yeah and you cared about Perry no I didn't you know you cared about him well I mean it was sold out in Melbourne I mean you I had to queue understand. you had to queue for hours to get into the theatre to see Perry to watch a squirrel yeah Okay. Well, in Australia, no. they don't have squirrels. No. There's you a know. reason we have possums and cats. What do you mean there's a reason? <laughs> well, there's a reason why we don't have squirrels. Well, they yeah, can't compete there's, with there's probably a reason that um, America doesn't have kangaroos too. Mm. Yeah. No, I quite like... I like squirrels. They're very... Um, very screwy. Ingenious. I quite like them. Yeah, they're fast. They're fast. Yeah, and they're, and they're clever. They're, they're definitely, you know, got the smarts on more than possums. But I actually learned things um, looking at Disney uh, documentaries about yes, Australia. Yes, you do. Oh, really? I, I learned that we had kangaroo rats. I never knew yeah, we had kangaroo rats. We just yeah. had kangaroos. Mm. And, of course, you know, um, um, that's because they... What was the living desert... Yes, the Living Desert was a doco, and I had to, I collected the Living Desert uh, cards out of the um, the Wheaties packets. Right. Or the there the there you go. The sixties, they had a little bit of uh, merchandising. Yeah. Which helped sell the brand. So yeah. the brand was helped by, you know, um, constantly being in the um, public eye. Well, it's funny because when you when you buy Disney products, they mm. have the name Walt Disney. Mm. And it's written in hand writing, you know. Yeah. And of course, everybody thought that that was his um, he, handwriting. No, it, it wasn't. It was but a corporatized. It, it was. And of course, when, when there's a funny stories when kids ask him for his autograph, it didn't look like him. It didn't look alike. And the kids say, "Hey, this is fake." <laughs> well, I can. <laughs> and they they give it back to him, and of course, it upset him. So I think he tried to draw. He, uh, he tried to do a signature like that, but he it learned never, that signature. It, it never worked, so he just handed out cards. No, I've seen signatures of his that look 
pretty close. Yeah, to but he tried to apparently, but he got sick of it, so he just handed out cards. Mm. Or like autographed. He made sure he had autographed photos and stuff like that. Yeah. On hand. Well, you know, you need to, don't you, really? Um, so let's talk more a little bit about um, the drawing process here. I'm trying to. Um, so what I've done while we've been yakking here, uh, I've used the brown pencil to establish form, and then I've gone in with a black pencil to, you know, obviously to create a little bit more contrast and just to pick out details, make it a little bit stronger so I can play with it a little bit more with um, a sculptural approach to drawing. So this is a paint pen. This is a Posca. It's got a little ball bearing. And um, it's going to give me a, a really good handle on the lightest parts of the drawing. So that's, that's why it's going to work for me to create that drama, which I want. Um, so um, the other thing is I'm going to be using a white pencil as well. So I'm going to probably um, strengthen a lot of these lines that you're seeing here. So it's going to get a bit stronger than um, a more sculptural approach to the drawing as we go. Um, so the Disney machine as it is now, of course, is just gobbling up all of these companies. And, you know, it's kind of perplexing. Um, and nobody really knows where it will end or what, 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 what does it actually mean to, you know, brands. Well, it's like, it's like I mean, what's happening with the Disney Corporation, it's, it's like a Tex Avery cartoon, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's right out of control. It's actually um, stepped over the bounds of history mm. and takeovers and stuff like that. Yeah, just... well, if you're a Disney shareholder, good for you, you yeah. know. But the rest of us who don't own shares in Disney, and, and even if, you know, if I own shares in Disney, I wouldn't want them to own The Simpsons or, or you know, keep buying up product, um, IP from everywhere. Well, you know, where does it end? I mean, well, your theory, a, your theory, you, you should talk about your theory because um, everything's going to be commodified to such a degree that mm. um, it's all coming from one factory. I mean, it, 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 in a way, he's buying up the opposition, and so all these different voices should, are, are being stilled long term. Yeah, but you all should. All these separate voices are being stilled. Yeah, but no, it's wrong to think that because you shouldn't be thinking of them as opposition. People need choice. They of need free they choice. Do, but, I mean, um, you don't want to be commodified and, and you know, dictated to and, and sort of like, you know, own the, every single aspect but, of our lives. But isn't that the... Is, isn't that the... the, the um, it's the American way gone wrong. No, but by, by what Disney's doing, mm. um, if it goes on for another, say, 30, 40 years, mm. surely, um, I mean, it's all got to get back to... Um, Someone bigger will buy them, maybe. No, but <laughs> is that what you're saying? As I was referring to the Tex Avery cartoon, I mean they'll they'll probably rename Earth uh, Disneyland or something. I don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? It's it's just getting so big it'll buy up it'll buy up the biggest corporations. I was joking about that before, but creativity. Well, I mean, people got excited when you know they started buying up Fox yeah. and Marvel Comics and yeah. and and. Um, you know, Henson's and, and all of these other companies. Star Wars. Star Wars. People got excited and said, oh, wow, we get, you know, Disney money and Disney creativity and it's like, you know, your family now owning these wonderful um, Well, it's a bit more complicated properties. than that but because, I mean, Disney was getting out of animation. Mm. Now, not, not many people know that. Mm. So they were, I mean... What they were noticed for, they were getting out of animation. Yeah. And then I thought, well, hang on, um, there are some successes. Why not buy Pixar? Pixar, all these different, you know, making the money, and we'll mm. still be in animation, but mm. we won't mm. have to have the problem. You know, it's, it's yeah. I, you know, you're contracting out. You're humanising the board of directors. I don't think they make decisions based on, on you know, what's good for animation, or what's good for no. America, or what's good for child childhood 
imagination or dreams. Well, they're Mul making the film, decisions based on cold hard cash. Well, the film Mulan was made because they want to open up the market in China. Right. Because of, there's this huge, you know, there's, there's a lot of bums on seats in China. Yeah. So that's where that's where Mulan came from. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? All right. I don't know. There's been a lot of Hawaiian um, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> films. Why there's been a lot of princesses are they trying to open too. Up the there's been a lot of princesses, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what Disney stands on the Me Too movement, but there's a lot of um, female role models in Disney films in the last 10 years. Well, I mean, they'd have to be, uh, you know, updated to reflect uh, modern times, you yeah. know? So you've probably got a transgender princess coming up one day soon. Who knows? Well, maybe not a princess, but maybe a transgender green frog or something like that, you know. Mm. I don't know, but the, the... I mean, we're just you're just postulating, but I just no, find it true, really... that's true, it's just that, you know... You scary go, that one company yeah. owns so much of the world's imagination. And, yes. Um, I, just, I just find it morally... Well, they say data is power... But yeah, Disney's gone after imagination is power, mm. you know. But you know, I mean, people are are. Um... But the world is changing. For instance, the the French Disneyland didn't didn't last. Mm. The the Hong Kong Disneyland didn't last. I mean, if you go to China, mm. virtually every second person has a Disney character plastered on their shoes or their their T-shirt as course, a knockoff. Yeah, they're all they're not paying copyright on that, no. but they really love the characters, you know. Yeah. And I'm saying that um uh, you know, the world's changing um with computers and uh I don't know. I Well, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. But it's not a you know, it's unprecedented what's actually happening. Yeah. It really is. It's well, I I I think that, you know, if it continues then um you know, those titles will be um, now irrelevant. They'll lose their relevance. They'll lose their market share yeah. because the people that love them for the reason they love them um, uh, moved on to other titles. So, Well, it's just that, you know, I think art, art is, I mean, if you can show your individuality in art, mm. express your inner demons, all those things in art, that's what shows through. That's what cuts through, as opposed to just mere illustration of what everybody else is doing at that time. Yeah. Um, and 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 they're the things that lead us on but to other what, things. What do you regard as art? Art is is the is well, the I area mean, that like, created by let's artists. Talk, let's just talk about art's it. not created by companies. No, but let, that's that's. But I'm saying let's let's talk about animation, like mm. um, the Fleischer Brothers, Ralph Bakshi. Mm. All these people are really important. You know. Mm. The independence, um, you know, uh, yeah. Plim Plimpton, all these people. Now, if all the major animation studios are, are, uh, are run by uh, Disney, yeah, and in the sense that, um, and and who runs the, the Disney, the corporation? It's a big corporation. It's um, they're, they're going to make um, what what you keep. I mean, one of your biggest uh, arguments is all about cookie cutting, and yeah. the characters are cookie cutted, you know, mm -hmm. because they work before, um, and I mean. The whole film industry is um, uh, is also affected by this process because yeah, the people who actually commercial business yeah the people who actually have all the power they're scared to make new ideas so right, they make the right. old ideas and that's what I think rehash that's what I'm saying that's what mm. I'm saying we're going to go into a really uh, formalised future um, with our entertainment and stuff you know um, well that's if it keeps I mean, making Brad, money if Brad it stops Bird, making money then they obviously have to rethink the whole strategy yeah but Brad Bird hopefully it'll not make money a guy like Brad Bird's you know he comes out of animation college uh, uh, Cal Arts whatever it was yeah and he's got all these sort of things he wants to do and he ends up doing the um, The Iron Giant which is a fantastic film mm. still a, it'll always be a fantastic film it's a classic it won't I don't think it'll age you know mm. and then he goes on to do um, The Incredibles yeah but I mean, um, because and you have John Lasseter and all those sort of people who, who are able to follow their dream through, mm. and that's what Disney did. He he had a dream and he, 
he had all these people to help him. Disney the man, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Disney the man. But I'm just saying Disney the corporation now, that's... Mm. It's, it's, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Right. It's, 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 yeah, it's, I'm not happy <laughs> with the Disney Corporation. So yeah. Disney Corp. Um, and now it's when you wish upon a um, a buck. A buck, yeah. When you wish yeah. upon a, um, a, a, a an economic statement, you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. So it's it's Disney that's relevant for the shareholders. It's not Disney relevant for the people. So yeah. um, you know, I mean, you can you can be you make um, say that I'm, I'm too cynical, but Aladdin live action, Lion King live action. Don't tell me it's animated. It's not. It's yeah, I know. I it mean, looks like those live sort action. of decisions are are, are are huge warning bells to me. Mm. Um, I mean, there are people who just won't even bother to go on there because they just know that it's... I mean, you know, they they refilm shot by shot um, mm. Psycho. Mm. Mm. Why? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> what is it, ego? What is it, you know? Um, well, I think well, they're, they're thinking that... Their thinking is that... What, for a new add, generation? Yeah. Yeah. And to well, see, did, did add you... something that was missing from the original thing. Yeah, but... It doesn't work that. It didn't work that way. I mean, no, because I mean, it wasn't anything missing. Disney was the one who started to re-release his films every nine years because a new generation of kids hadn't seen Bambi. They hadn't yeah. seen uh, Dumbo. Yeah. They hadn't seen um, uh, you know, Pinocchio. Well, so, why, why don't they do that? Why don't they well, just no, put but those they're always, They've always done that, and they, they, they've never stopped doing that. Mm. But now, well, why not remake with Angelina Jolie? Why not remake uh, Dumbo? Why not remake The Lion King with the latest tools we've got because mm. everybody you know, wants to see the latest tools in action and we can do magic with the action. Mm. But I don't know. It's, you know... Um, yeah, look, a lot of people... If, if it works, why touch it? Why, and, and like Pinocchio, I think people well, would be watching Pinocchio for the next 2,000 years if we lived that long. It's just... It's, you know, it's just a gem of a film. It hasn't... It hasn't, you know, hasn't aged. Well, um, it, uh, looking at it, it's almost like the decisions made that um, the board doesn't like cartoons. Yeah, well, that's what, that's the, what it looks like. They decided to get out of animation. Now you can say that, oh, no, it was a different reason, or yeah. they did it for this, or they did it for that, and they're not replacing the cartoons. But that's what it looks like to me. But I'm saying the, the Disney Corporation... Mm. It's not just a corporation. It, it's sort of, it's like a litmus test of what's going to happen in the future. I think because they're so big. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, it's not yeah. just we're, we're, so we're not just talking about the politics of one company. We're talking about it's a litmus test because of oh, for sure, it affects other other brands. You know, DreamWorks is based on the success of Disney and Pixar. Yes. So you know everything that Dick, that Pixar, everything that DreamWorks views as a success is based on how it compared to Disney. Disney. That's right. So you know, I mean I'm I'm I love DreamWorks, but well, again, a lot of DreamWorks stuff I don't like because of yeah. the cookie cutter thing. Well you know, when 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 they actually barefaced lied and said that um you know, Peabody characters. and Sherman was a homage to the original Peabody and Sherman. And I looked at it and I was like, what the? This is, there's no Peabody and Sherman in here. You've, you've, not, you've not watched Bullwinkle. You've not watched Rocky and Bullwinkle. Because that's what I'm looking at. <clears throat> I'm looking at the, the style of the animation. And... You know, and, and it's it's just so slick and um, commercial, and there's nothing new in it. There's nothing new in it, and there's nothing old in it. There's nothing. There's no homage to um, Bullwinkle, the Bullwinkle show, at all. Um, and then you have you know other directors like Gendy Tartowski, who I absolutely love his work. But he does his homework, and his his um, love of the 
genre is evident in the style and the, do, the do style wanna, of the animation. Do you want to name a couple of his movies so people know what you're talking about out there? Yeah, Hotel Transylvania. Okay. Um, it's the first time I ever saw holds in a 3D CGI film. Holds? Yeah, holds are when the... Um, Wrestling holds? No, the character just holds still. Yeah. So that you can appreciate the drawing, right? The, yes. the pose is so yes. strong yes. and so iconic that yes. it just holds still. And well, in what, CGI, so much people are scared. animation is just constantly moving just it's just yeah because it's 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 the wrong illusion of life that yes. they're after yes they're after it's like trying to create you know draw um something photographically real well w i mean and escaping the whole idea of drawing something that looks like it's alive yeah so that's the only thing that um i think the magic i think the actual magic of animation is, is well, it's, it's is, what is, is Disney creating, promised was is, an is illusion creating, of life. Is, that's right. It's creating movement, mm. but not realistically. No, but Walt Disney knew that. He used to tell his uh, animators on Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs um, to draw realism. And they would go and draw the characters photographically real. He said, no, 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 no. I wanted realism. Yeah, like they're alive. Yes. That's it's alive. He, w he wasn't explaining it very well, but yeah. he was actually meaning yeah. to draw them, so, have the, uh, the effect of them yeah. feeling like they're, they're alive. So, oh, look, I, don't, I, I remember when, um, when computers first started really coming into animation. Mm. They um, weren't perfect you, you, computers. You, you were aware that you were looking at a program. Yeah. And that the program had the whip hand, not the animators. Like when pianos first came in, um, as opposed to harpsichords, mm. um, they dominated the actual structure of the, of, of, the, of the keyboard and all that sort of stuff. Mm. It, 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 it controlled what people were going to do with it. But then once you... If you know how to use it, then you do what you want to do with it. You do what you want with it. You're not confined by the limitations of, of, of the, the technology. And I felt that so many, so many films, like um, in in um, in the Snowman film by um, a short film about the Snowman by um, Raymond Briggs, which was animated, and also in scenes in. Um, the Hunchback of Notre Dame by Disney, they have these three sixty degree uh, things where they, they fly around the the, hunt, the, the, the Notre Dame mm. or, or a mountain or whatever it is. And it, it, it's continuous. And, you know, it, it's like, uh-oh, um, in, in Tarzan, the kids' movie, that mm. the, he slides through the jungle and he's going through this big, long slide and you mm. think, oh, well, that's, that's designed around the... The computer game where he's going to be sliding down something, you know. The, yeah. You see all these things, and it, it takes you away from it. it like well, it's it like, happened in Aladdin. Yeah, that's right. Coming out of the cave. That's right. Is a game. Yeah, that's right. So, but they've got they've got their eye on these things. They've got their mm. mind on for future things. And I'm saying it that the the technology, the technique, takes away from the actual um, magic of it, you know, because mm. you you're. Um, you start to figure out what, what's that for that shot, you know. Well, animation is also about um, not animating. That's animation right. is about um, filmmaking. It's a filmmaking decision. That's right. Decision. I mean, that, that's why so, Miyazaki is such a master because yeah. he he actually makes you appreciate uh, the action because they're not. It's not all frenetic the action. Light coming over a, a yeah. grass. Take the time to enjoy yeah, the a scene. Cloud passes over. You know the um, magic of the story of the yeah. place that he's to create the world. Us. How nature. I mean, you don't yeah. have to sit under a tree no. for five years to appreciate nature. You know. Yeah, but he builds a world. Yes. So a lot of filmmakers and, don't. I mean, do he that. ransacks from all sorts of places. You know. Sure. But at the same time, you know. There's a mystical, religious, huge. I mean, he he really knows what he's doing. He really knows. He really understands kids, and he really understands how to make a, a story. Yeah. 
Um, whereas, you know, you get back to your cookie cutter characters, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, one of the reasons they're making that particular story is to sell mm. product, mm. you know? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot missing from the conversation. Um, the there's a lot missing from that film. moustache too. Oh, he had a big <clears throat> moustache, didn't he? Um, well, I could add a bit more body. Yeah, a bit of body there. A bit more moustache there. So, um... Uncle yeah. Walt. Yeah. But I loved, um, Walt Disney. I loved the, uh, you know, growing up. It was like a very important thing. Well, one of the most galvanising experiences of my childhood was looking at Fantasia. Mm. And Fantasia's actually aged a hell of a lot. But it's still a, a very interesting film. Mm. And at the time, he, he wanted to have surround sound mm. and special, uh, uh, you know, um, he actually wanted to make a Fantasia every 10 years mm. um, where they, they keep on adding bits of classical music or jazz or whatever it is. Mm. Um, and, and they keep on forever updating it. So it's like a, an animated hit parade every uh, five years or 10 years, you mm. know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was an extraordinary uh, feat. Do you, do you remember seeing um, uh, 101 Dalmatians? <clears throat> no. Well, instead of getting all the women to paint the cells, to mm. do the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the outlines, mm. he just used Xerox machines. He put, he put the drawings, the pencils, into Xerox machines. Mm. Instead of using paper, he used cells. <laughs> yeah. And so you had that rough line. Yeah, that broken line, the pencil broke. line. That's right. Mm. Um, and I, it was I, part of the style that yeah, they tried to create. Yeah, part of the style. Yeah, they did that with Jungle Book. Yes. Yeah. So it was a new, it was a new technique. So yeah. the and the heavy the multi, line, the, the thick multi, and thin line that the they had camera, with um, Pinocchio the, and the multi plane character uh, camera. All yeah. those things that Disney did mm. were really impressive. But it just seemed like he was on a he was on the highway to reality. And I think he by, I, I think he turned. He should have turned off at Albuquerque personally. <laughs> <laughs> Albuquerque, yeah. yeah. Famous um, Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny line. It's a nice line to finish on, I think. What finish, finish on, on, on Bugs, from Bugs Bunny, Bunny talking yeah. about Walt Disney? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, we should do Chuck Jones. Um, well, actually, in like you know. In the history of entertainment yep. and of how our society is changed by popular culture, yep. I mean, this guy is... Is there anybody come near him? No one's come near him. He's the, the master, the maestro, the daddy, the big daddy of animation. Everybody m measures up to yes. Disney. So yeah. this, is, uh, this is Uncle Walt. This is Uncle Walt. This is the, the photo, the reference that I had. And this is my rendition of Uncle Walt, um, of Walt Disney. So um, I don't know if I've got the uh, the lightness. I think I've got probably the left hand side is more him than. Oh no, there's a little bit of. So you be the judge. He looks a bit. <laughs> yes, you be the judge. Mm. Um, his eyes are a bit um, spaced out. Well, I, I've intentionally put them there. I mean, they could be. I know you've intentionally possibly, put. Them. They were deliberately put there. Yeah, they were deliberately put there. It, it uh, sounds like a line from two thousand and one Space Odyssey. Darker. They were deliberately buried. Probably like that. Yeah. Well, um, there you go. This is um, Jim Bridges, Franz Cantor, and Walt Disney, and saying we'll see you on the flip side. On the flip side, okay. And the flip side has when you black wish ears, upon a star, round black ears. Your dreams come true. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>